welcome to The Skeptic Zone, the podcast from Australia for science and reason. Hello and welcome to The Skeptic Zone for the 12th of February 2010, show number 69. Richard Saunders here with you once again. On today's episode, we have an interview with a mentalist from the UK, Philip Escoffey, who's currently touring Australia. And if you can get a chance to go along and see Philip Escoffey, I sincerely recommend it. Details are coming up in the interview. That's followed by a clip from New Zealand television with our good friend Vicky Hyde from the uh, New Zealand Skeptics, where she discusses homeopathy. Well worth a listen. And to round off the show today, we have the Think Tank, a bit of an extended Think Tank, because we know you love it so much. So sit back, grab that nice drink of your choice, and enjoy this episode of The Skeptic Zone. Philip Escoffey, mentalist extraordinaire, is currently touring Australia from the UK. A wonderful act where he can seemingly read your mind. Quite incredible. Philip Escoffey is also a good sceptic and uh, I caught up with him a few days ago here in Sydney. Delighted to be here with uh, Philip Escoffey in your wonderful little apartment oh. here at Circular Quay. Do you like what I've done with it? It's brilliant. I love it. The, the, the paintings are particularly oh, good. I like Yes, they're all, all my own work. And I'm thinking of knocking through there and just opening it up a bit, but maybe next week. All right. Oh, you won't be here next week. No. <laughs> no I'm lying for attention. <laughs> so this is... Um, you're within a very short walk of where you're performing as mm-hmm. we record, which is the Sydney Opera House, yes, in fact. Yes. What's that like for an artist as yourself to perform oh, at the Sydney Opera House? It's, 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 it's a bit of a coup, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I feel like an imposter slightly, but no one's rumbled me yet. As I say at the end of my show, I'm genuinely so grateful to people who come and see the show because I was previewing this show in a back room in a pub in Battersea not much more than a year and a half ago. Really? So to be... Um, in this fabulous sort of 300 seater at the at the opera house is just yeah. If, if listen, if my career goes nowhere after this, I, I'm I'm fine. It's okay. I've done the opera house. But before the opera house and uh, after this little uh, preview, you were doing Edinburgh. Is that right? I've done two Edinburghs now. Mm-hmm. Um, 08 was my first, where I did this show for the first time. Six impossible things. In 09, I did six more impossible things, um, and. Between those, I, I went to Melbourne in April last year with oh, the yeah. first show oh, yeah. at the Comedy Festival. And that's kind of where things kicked off for me in Australia, having had a very difficult first week where I couldn't really give tickets away. And I was only in a smallish hundred-seater um, in, at Trades, which is one of the sort of... It's not the town hall, it's... it's okay. the, the, yes. Our Melbourne listeners would certainly know yeah, where Yeah, they'll know where yeah. Trades is, Trades Hall. Um, yeah, first week, couldn't give tickets away. I, I don't think they really knew what I was, so I think a lot of people, is he, is he like sort of John Edwards crossing over, is he contacting mm-hmm. dead relatives, what, what's this about? And then I had the good fortune to appear on a couple of radio shows, one in particular where um, the hosts were seemingly a little sort of dumbstruck by something I did, and because they are renowned for being fairly hard-nosed and sceptical and known by their audience, so their reaction was, uh-huh. was, was gold, really, and... and from then on we were sold out and put on extra shows so it really took off in Melbourne so then I came back to Australia in September last year and did a month in Brisbane and then did another week in Melbourne to sort of pick up on some of the people who'd wanted to come to see the show but hadn't had a chance and that was great did a week there in a bigger venue in the in the ballroom the new ballroom at Trades which is about 210 people and and Sydney kindly invited me to come to the Opera House now and I've been here well, they extended it for a week. So, when, when did you kick off here? In I started on the. I got here on the tenth. I think the first show was on the eleventh or the twelfth. Can't remember of January. Yeah. And we were scheduled to go to the thirty-first, and then they added another week, which we're in the middle of now. Which is very flattering. It's hugely sure flattering. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, all the fan letters my mother wrote under various guises <laughs> seem to have worked. <laughs> um, now you also 
I know happened to uh, get a little appearance here on Sydney radio. Yeah, but I, I, I didn't hear it, but I heard another radio commentator, uh, Glenn Wheeler on 2GB, because we're friends and I'm, mm-hmm. I appear on his show, and he mentioned you to me. He said, there's this bloke called Philippus Coffee, and he, he just knocked the socks off these other radio people. I've done a few. I've done 2GB and 2UE and is that Triple J? Triple J, yes. Yeah, yes. A guy called The Doctor, yep. Lindsay, yep. very nice chap. A guy called Steve Kinane. Steve Kinane, on yes, know him well, yeah. Um, WSFM, Amanda and Jones. That's right. Yeah, they, they were delighted. They've got a lovely thing going on. I think the two of them. You've you've been everywhere. I know, right? <laughs> you are. Um, I just go where I'm told by the by the by the publicists. Not, not having uh, not having heard those appearances myself, the thing that my friend Glenn Wheeler was impressing upon me was, you obviously did some little bits of mentalism mm. to the hosts mm. at the time, and that went down very well. Mm. Yeah, it's it's. They, they're always very keen for you to, to perhaps do something with callers. And I kind of try and counsel them against that for two reasons. Um, firstly, callers aren't always the best reactors. A, a sort of open mouth silence doesn't make great radio. <laughs> so they might well be stunned back at, back at their home, but that doesn't really carry. And also the, the rest of the listeners are much more trusting of their host saying yeah. that was extraordinary yeah. than somebody who's called in where the assumption might be that it's just a friend of mine or somebody yes. I've set up. Yes. So I try and do something with the host. I invariably get them to think of somebody that they'd like to interview that they never have. It seems relevant to what they, what they do for a living. And I give them the choice of it being somebody that they'd like to interview because they're a fan of them, theirs and, and would like to spend some time with them, talking to them, or because they can't stand them. You might want to pick the head of homeopathy or something like that and <laughs> have a bit of a bash for a couple of minutes. Um, so sometimes I get the name that they're thinking of and that's all very jolly and, and right, they seem to right. like that. Well, whatever the one was my friend heard, you did. You nailed it. Exactly. And which is, of course, greatly impressive. Yes. And, um, yeah. It's funny you should say that about the listeners because this is um, something that uh, our old mate Yuri Geller certainly milked for all it's worth. And you probably know of the switchboard mm-hmm. meltdown effect yeah, that Gilly used to do. Absolutely. If you if you ask if you ask all the listeners to go and get an old watch out of their their bedside table, one that hasn't worked for a long time, and you've got let's say conservatively twenty thousand listeners, and you only need one percent of those listeners to phone up for your switchboard to melt down. But it gives yeah. the impression yeah. that everyone in the and my father's a watchmaker, so I'm more than aware that if you take any old watch and just hold it, just warming up the oils in the watch, are more than likely to make it tick away again for 10 or 15 seconds when they sort of look at it again in half an hour and see that it's not working anymore <laughs> they, they don't call in and the program's yeah. over it's um, a great expression too isn't it the switchboard went into meltdown oh. what, what do you mean it, yeah. it was so many yes. calls that the uh, thing actually started <laughs> physically melting and if it did Geller would probably claim that as well yeah. I melted the switchboard that's right um, yeah I, I've been <laughs> at, at least three three times in the last six radio interviews I've done I've gone in and there's been some technical problem where the re- interview had started but my mic wasn't working or suddenly some piece of equipment stopped working and you just think so much of that then gets claimed doesn't it by the psychic um, it's, it's interesting you should say that because that is exactly what happened the time I went to see John Edward here in Australia mm-hmm. uh, he was doing a talk show one of the Sydney uh, morning talk shows um, Channel 9 I think I, I uh, it was live so I didn't want to put my foot in it so I just watched mm-hmm. And as it happened, he didn't do any cold reading whatsoever. He just talked about how wonderful he was. And mm-hmm. that. But the point that I'm getting to is they made a comment to him about something to do with the monitor in his waiting room or the green room, something buzzing out mm-hmm. or on the fritz. And he claimed that. Of course. He claimed that. And now that I've had a bit of experience going into these, these, these radio stations, it's, it's more the exception when something doesn't <laughs> flicker or buzz or do something. And in the theatre... I know in the show report that the stage manager wrote, there was lots of interference on their, their comm system. You know, the stage manager and the lighting guy and the sound guy all, all talked to each other on, yeah. on a comm set, and there was some, some dreadful interference. We had what sounded like a taxi rank coming through on the speakers in the first week, and that was odd. Um, so when you've got that amount of equipment, the chance that something is going to, and especially in this kind of humidity and climate, mm. it, it seems, as I say, the exception when I go into one of these studios and something doesn't go a bit wonky. Um, so if it is your inclination to claim these things as, as, as some some effect, 
then, then you're, yeah. you're, you're going to have plenty of scope to do that. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what also works very well on radio, and, and you might not think of, it would, but it really does, is good old-fashioned spoon bending, mm-hmm. which I've done many times on radio. Mm-hmm. Well, this is such a visual thing. Mm-hmm. The point is the host will sell it to the yes. audience. He says, yeah. oh, yes, he's got the spoon, and suddenly the host is completely surprised because yeah. the spoon's bending, yeah. and he's saying, I'm not kidding the spoon, and yeah. then you hear the clinkle, clinkle, clinkle yeah. on the... Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and it can only whet people's appetite to want to then come and see what that actually looks like if you're if you're promoting a show where you're actually going to be doing something yeah, like that. Yeah. I mean, most most material is is visual. What we do, um, so it does rely on a, on a on a host basically emoting and selling it and mm. telling the listeners. Uh, and the listeners know their host. So when I was in Melbourne and these two, I think they're both the, were lawyers once and they've been on the breakfast show for 15 years, a pair called Ross and, and John, um, when they were sort of seemingly flabbergasted, that just meant so much more because I think two days earlier they'd had some psychic in who, in who they'd ripped to shreds who told one of them that their pet was ill and the other one that they were about to go on holiday and, well, no, I'm not about to go on holiday and when I left this morning my dog was fine, thanks very much. <laughs> so it just happened to be that the person didn't get neither of these fairly general statements actually hit yeah. and they were having none of it. They, it they, really? Oh, yeah. They, they, and I think they were already actually to tear strips off me but then it becomes pretty apparent quite quickly that I don't come at it from this look at the powers I have. I come from quite the opposite position of look how easily I can give the impression I have these powers yeah. so you can't really pull the rug out from under me because I'm I'm not claiming anything in the exactly. first place exactly mm. you're, you're what we call on our side of the of the game um, completely upfront and honest mm. or as the magician Jamie in Swiss I don't know if you mm-hmm. know Jamie says uh, he says question is uh, a dishonest uh, no an honest liar yeah, yeah. an honest yeah. liar honest. yes I, yes I, 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 I deceive people honestly. Yes, um, yeah. like any good magician does. Of course. Yes. yes. Now, would you class yourself as a magician or what? Depends who I'm talking to, really. Um, I mean, yes. What what I do, mentalism, as it as it's sometimes referred to, um, mind reading, um, is 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 very much a branch of sort of magic in magic. the more general sense. Um, I don't. As far as the public are concerned and my website's concerned, I don't really have any mention of magic or magicians or any links to any of that kind of world, simply because I don't, I don't proffer any rationale for how I do what I do. And I think that's a weakness on some levels. I think part of the appeal of watching a, a Geller or a, a Darren Brown is a, a fairly known and mm. successful mentalist or mind reader in the UK. They, they have different rationales for their... For their seeming abilities, Geller obviously claims it's all psychic and paranormal. Brown takes the opposite view, of being very specific and saying it's not psychic, but then saying it's all body language and reading people and manipulation and influence. I, I don't make any claims, and I think there is a weakness to that because people are fundamentally interested. I did think on Tuesday, I think it was Groundhog Day on Tuesday. Oh yes, um, that that's quite a nice seeming explanation for how you do what you do maybe you are trapped in Groundhog Day so I know what's going to happen in my show because it happened yesterday and it happened the day before and I'm just living this horribly monotonous and, yeah. and, 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 and repeatable day but that is how I know that those shapes will get chosen or those, yeah. those countries will yeah. be picked because yeah. it's the same every day same. now um, of course I had the pleasure of seeing your show a, a couple of weeks ago and it was fabulously entertaining I was laughing and clapping with everybody uh, you must get some quite interesting um, reactions to what you do mm. on stage from yeah, your audience from time to time. It's the old Dunninger maxim, isn't it? Those that believe no evidence is necessary and for those that don't believe no evidence will ever suffice. People come in fairly polarised in their opinions on, 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 on what's going on on stage and despite it being fairly clear as the show progresses that my position is one of scepticism, um, those that want to believe that I'm psychic... Um, tend to carry on believing that I'm psychic well after the show and corner me and say, I know you say you're not a psychic, but you know, give, mm. me, a, give me a wink and mm. I, I know you, obviously you are and you know you are and I can understand why you don't tell people because they probably want to dissect you in the bowels of the FBI. Like me, sceptics like me. Yeah, and, and, it's, and that's their... You see, the point is, if, if they have a firm belief in psychics and that's, that's their thing, that's their need, if, if perhaps it is a need, um, then seeing me up on stage doing these things and not claiming psychic ability is, creates a bit of cognitive dissonance, doesn't it? Because, well, wait a minute, if he can do this stuff, which is every bit as impressive as any psychic I've seen, 
then I have to perhaps concede that maybe the psychics that I've been paying are, are, are not psychic. And, you know, and they just don't want to go down that route. So rather than adjust their position on the psychics they know, they, they, they take me and put me into that group. That's one reaction. Yeah. Other reactions are that... Um, there was lots of gasping behind me, uh, <laughs> well, that's, that's, which is... Great, you know. I, I, I try and suck out all the oxygen from the room to That's create right. that. <laughs> <laughs> a gasp's a gasp. I'm not proud. Yeah. Um, l- listen, it's designed to make um, lay people say, "Gosh, uh, you know, this is. I don't. I just don't see how that is possible." Um, what my, my interest is is what people do in the face of, of, of that. So you've spent an hour watching something that you didn't think was possible. Do you now abandon the reason that you came in with? And, and deduce that maybe he's he's psychic, or do you listen to the sort of subtext of what I'm saying and yeah. And, yeah. and and acknowledge just because we don't necessarily understand something straight away doesn't mean we have to put a, a magic a magic veil over it and. Well, you, you certainly don't let that side of the show become too heavy. It, it's sort of woven into the show itself. You're not up there preaching skepticism really by any means. No. I mean, your primary um, focus is to give a good, entertaining yes, show, of course. That's that's the goal. There is that narrative if people want it, and it's it's gentle. I, you know, I, I do my little Jerry Springer outro at the end, which is the 20 seconds or so, which takes the wonderful quote from Douglas Adams for me. Then, mm-hmm. Because people ask me, how, you know, well, what are you? Are you psychic? Do you believe in psychic? So Douglas Adams' quote, there is enough beauty in the garden without believing in fairies at the bottom of it, sums it up. Yeah. But then people still take that as an indication that I'm saying I'm psychic. Really? Which I don't, you know, two or two can <laughs> equal seven if, if, that's, if that's your need, I guess. I, you know. But I'm not there, to, I'm really not there to, 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 to promote any particular thing. I, well, I guess I'm there to promote thought. Yes. You know, just yes. I ask, I say that what you believe is fascinating, but why you believe that, that's really interesting. And, and it's a hard question to ask and a hard question to answer. Why do I? believe in that we were talking when we last saw each other about delusion and self-delusion yes and how can you possibly know but just being aware that yes. you might be yes. even if you're not sentient of it um surrounding yourself with people that you can probably trust to tell you is is a good start yeah if if i'm right in assuming that you want to live free of that self-delusion and i think most people would say they do most people would say they do except whether they want to is a different thing when it when it comes to the crunch the the defence mechanism, the human brain will rally to its own defence. Well, extraordinary. Well, and that was the that was I think the nub of what um, Dr. Rachel and yourself and I talked about the first time we we met up. Yeah. That you can't just go breaking people's dreams and beliefs as sceptics, as the sceptical movement. I think we have to become a little more sophisticated because the people that we are trying to, or we, but the sceptical movement is trying to expose, for want of a better word, offer their clients, their people, they offer them something. We just come and take that away and we don't replace it. So going back to that example we talked about, if you go to a, um, a low-caste member of the Indian society um, and who, who live a very difficult life, by certainly by our standards, yeah. um, and, and tell them there is no caste, there is no um, reincarnation, there is no life after death, and look, I can prove it, look at my clever work here, well, piss off, because I need to believe there's reincarnation, because otherwise I'm not getting up tomorrow morning, because this is, I need to believe I'm coming back for something else. Um, we, 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 we tell our children Father Christmas doesn't exist in a very gentle and careful way, because we realise that too soon, and you know, some people don't agree with telling them Father Christmas exists in the first in the place, first place yeah, and yeah. that's a different argument. I yeah. think Jermaine Greer is very against that. Um, and it would be interesting how I deal with that with my children when that when that arises. It's a mixed bag. It it is. Are they going to be the only kids in the class? That, yeah. that, that, you, know, <laughs> you know, do I want my children to be the pioneers? Probably yeah. not. Well, um, that's right. yeah. But yes, as skeptics, we have to replace what we take away. If somebody is bereaved and they're getting comfort um, in inverted commas from a from a skeptic, uh, from a psychic, from a psychic, <laughs> yes. Then, well, a skeptic. You oh, never yeah, know. Well, that would be nice, and I think that's the point. We, um, we we can prove that psychologically maybe that that sort of those visits to the psychic inhibit a true grieving process. So there is harm because you know one of the arguments is well even if these psychics aren't real, is it really hurting anyone if that? Well, it's, it's gets the old what's the harm argument? Yeah. yeah. So if we can show there is there is potentially harm, we have to, we have to replace it with something else. And for me, the psychic community is 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 a symptom. It's not the cause. It's a symptom of a need that exists. 
And as sceptics, if we're going to say, well, that isn't the solution, that isn't the panacea, save your money, do something else, we have to offer an alternative. And um, we have to be kind as sceptics. Yes. I think. Oh, it's, it's that's very, important. very... Because no one will listen otherwise. If you just go and bash people, yeah. their defences will go up and... Well, the defences are up anyway, so you have yeah. to be even more, even more careful. But that's a very, very difficult line to tread sometimes because we're all human, and, and I, I succumb to this from time to time where I just get this feeling that I have to act or do something, mm. which may come across as being hard or harsh mm. or something like that. Um, and it's, a, it's a difficult. But what is that feeling? Why do you have to? Why do you have to do that? What is that? Because you, you, you told me about you know somebody you were testing and it and, and, and they clearly were sincere in their belief yeah. and you were slowly dismantling it in front of their eyes and yeah. you, you just started feeling genuinely sorry oh, for I the did. guy I and did. Have, what, 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 why did I why did I need to do that in the first place and I I kind of understand the answer but at the same time it's an important question to keep revisiting yeah them. oh I, I, and you were making the point before that. I said, I, I felt sorry for this particular guy because I could tell he was sincere and things were falling apart in front of him. Of course, he quickly corrected it in his own mind, so they're bulletproof in a way. Yeah. And you were saying maybe our sympathy should also lie with the genuine crooks out there because they're, they're such a morally bankrupt state. Yeah, you know, as, as we, yeah, we, I, I don't steal, um, not because... I'm, I'm a good person or because I'm gonna, I want to get to heaven or I, I, I don't steal because I've had an upbringing which has shown me and I did when I was little you know I stole from my mum's purse mm -hmm. that kind of silly you yes. know but you were finding the boundaries and I think I stole sweets from sweet shops and yeah. it was awful really but, but I've grown up to realise that that's not where my happiness lies um I, I can't even put a New Zealand dollar into a into a in, into the plate at a restaurant when it was pointed out to me yesterday. I just think, oh no, because that'll come out of someone's pay, and I don't like then living with that feeling. So it's a selfishly driven thing, but I think everything is selfishly driven. Yeah, that's a good. Yeah. That's fine. Selfish is okay. Um, thoughtless isn't, but selfish is. Um, so the people that do do this, and, and we were talking about very high profile faith healers. Yeah. And um, travelling service. Yeah. Yeah. I, I believe in the opposite of karma. I don't think if you do something bad, something bad will then happen to you. I think if you do something bad, it's because something bad has already happened to you. People who get kicked as children tend to do more kicking in later life than people who don't get kicked as children. Um, if you keep kicking a dog, it will turn on you and start to bite. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not as satisfying because if you see somebody doing something nasty, that feeling of, well, his comeuppance will... will, will will be imminent that's a nice feeling to feel there is this sort of checks and balances but there are plenty of people who've done some fairly horrific things in this world who haven't had that um, sort of seeming penance come back their way yeah. but I do believe that something has happened to them at some point um, you show me a mass murderer a sex offender a prolific sort of nasty and I will show you a dysfunctional child in some way now this isn't some woolly liberal oh everyone needs a cuddle and that will solve the world although I think a cuddle can go an awful long way <laughs> Um, but but it's I, I'm not aware of any cases of, of, of mass offenders, these sort of prolific serial killers, who haven't had something quite dreadful happen. And that doesn't mean that they were brought up in bankruptcy. Or you can I think Burkina Faso until recently was one of the happiest countries in the world, although it was the poorest. Oh yeah, yeah. I don't think that's the yeah. case anymore. I think one of the Scandinavians have taken over. Yeah. But you know, the, it's not about that. But it is about. Um, unconditional love from parents I think that's about the biggest yeah. the biggest boon you can be given in early life and not everyone gets that and I'm you know so so these people who go out and, and when, when we certainly we know you're talking about people in general but specifically as far as we're concerned we're talking about the people who hijack what you do and, and some of the things I know how to do and mm -hmm. pass themselves off so as having magical psychic powers yeah. or the, the ability to remove curses is a yeah. popular one, you yeah. know? Yeah, absolutely. And to, to be fair to them, we've, as mind readers, we've nicked more of their skills than they've yeah. nicked of ours, actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, that's, not, that's not so important. But yes, if you can, if you can absolutely knowingly sell somebody who you know can ill afford it, some pendant or, 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 or thing that you've made them believe will protect them from something and you've tapped into a vulnerability, I'm glad I'm not that person. Yeah. I can't imagine that when the lights go out at night, 
and there's no noise that it isn't very loud in their head on mm. some level. And if it isn't, they're even more detached from feeling anything than than those that do have a bit of, of, of sort of self awareness. I, I I think there would certainly be a percentage of them out there who would say, "Oh, it's just business." Yeah, but That's I think the business. But I think to do that business and not feel any kind of pang of conscious or conscience means that on the other end of the spectrum you don't feel beautiful, kind, lovely things either. Possibly so. You're just a bit numb and Possibly. the whole world is a bit numb to you yeah. and everyone is just another wallet to be to be raped and and I just wouldn't swap with them for all the money in the no. world because no. if, 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 if you can't feel remorse at doing something wrong you can't feel the equivalent at the other end of the emotional spectrum, the joyous things, the happy things, yeah. the loving things. You can't trust anyone. You can't. How can you trust anyone when you know you're doing such... Um, it just, it's, a, it's a horribly bankrupt place to be. I think for you and I, it certainly is. We would certainly to contemplate that. But mm. I wonder what it is like to be in the head of someone like these um, travelling circus faith healers who come to Australia mm. from time to time, the big production. Yeah. Thousands yeah. of people flocking in and the uh, pantomime healings they mm. do on stage, which, is, which are just yeah. cryingly pathetic. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, th- I, I, I always find that when you see them interviewed on a more one-to-one basis, although they are brilliant in those big, faceless environments, um, they are actually very awkward and uncomfortable people when it gets a bit more intimate and personal. They maybe, don't handle that very well. Maybe it's also the power trip. I mean, these people yeah. are surrounded by uh, an entourage. Yeah. There, there has money flowing in. Um, I think jets. the money becomes almost irrelevant after a while. It just becomes... Part of o- it? Often, often these people probably didn't get a lot of attention at school um, and then they discovered that, well, wait... Because you can be king of the castle when you're a psychic. No one can prove you wrong yeah. as such. Yeah, yeah. So suddenly there's this thing which gives them currency, and invariably it's some of the more bewildered and lost people that start to gravitate towards them. But then for the first time, you know, the most punishing thing you can do to anyone, particularly a child, is send them to Coventry, as we say. I don't know if you have that expression. Put, don't talk to them. We call it sending someone to Coventry. Oh, yeah. If you just don't talk to them. Right. It's the cruelest thing you can do to, uh, you know. So that the, the kid that runs around the playground just pulling people's hair and punching them, at least being told to piss off is somebody communicating with them. It's better than the silence that they endure. I can't, haven't got the social skills to go and make friends with anyone, but at least if I run up to you, punch you and run away, you will react to me. And we know that when you've got these examples of children for whatever reason being just kept in a, in a stimulus-free environment for whatever reason... It is the most damaging thing, and it's the hardest thing to bring them back from. If you, mm. I, I don't, I'm not a, I'm not a qualified psychologist in any way, and so I don't know the, the, the periods of time. But I know you don't have to to leave a baby without stimulation for too long before some very permanent and 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 serious damage starts to take place. So we are a social beast. So these people that turn into these big evangelists or whatever it may be, invariably at school were the ones that had sand kicked in their face, mm. and. And developing these skills and the power and the attention that it gave is so important to them because it's the thing they craved for and so it's long. It's their life. It turns into yeah. their life. It's who they are. I mean, I saw a documentary with our, with our friend, the Spoonbender. Mm-hmm. And he was in, in, I think, Romania. He'd gone with his family. And he'd spent the first five minutes saying he wouldn't bend any spoons, that he was now going to use his power. And, you know, within seconds, any air hostess who deigned to watch was having a spoon bent for him. Then. Um, but he was, he was in Romania and he was surrounded by these kids who'd seen the camera crew that was with him Um, and he said to them do you know who I am and no these 13 year old Romanian kids had no idea who he was so he didn't like that very much and then he said do you know Michael Jackson and they all said yeah Michael Jackson and then he said he's my friend now how how tragic is that really I mean it's laughable but bless him he just wants a cuddle that he's having to tell these 13 year old kids that he's friends with Michael Jackson which is a moot point um, uh, that, that he's, he's their friend so that they want to talk uh-huh. Uh-huh. That, yeah yeah um, I'd, yeah, yeah, I'd yeah. rather be slightly less wealthy yeah <laughs> well um, now let's quickly discuss once again your show because I know our listeners especially those listeners in Adelaide 
now have the opportunity oh, to go and Adelaide. see you. And I think you've got some details. There I have. Us. Yes. Um, I'm, I've never been to Adelaide. Oh, it's beautiful. I hear lovely yeah. things about it. And they're, they're all free settlers, which makes the psychology different, I'm led to believe. <laughs> um, Adelaide, I will be at the in the Garden of Unearthly Delights in the Umbrella Revolution, which is a big top tent. And I'll be performing at 8.45 between the 12th of February and the 14th of March. Excellent. And then I trundle off to Melbourne after that, yes. any Melbourne listeners. And I'll be at Trades Hall between the 24th and the 18th um, in the new ballroom up there. And I think it's 7 o'clock there except Sundays when it's 6. Well, I can certainly recommend that Skeptics Own listeners should get along. Oh, thank you very much. And enjoy Philip's show. And if you happen to uh, uh, catch his attention uh, after the show or have say hello oh please do yeah yeah. yeah. Um, well I, I tend to be at the door when people are leaving for various reasons which we won't go into yep and um, yeah that's my favourite bit chatting away getting asked by pregnant ladies what it's going to be <laughs> they don't like the answer ugly <laughs> so I don't say it you don't but say I do think it I'm glad you don't say that that's good and if people want to check out your website where should they head oh the website doesn't really have... I, I, I have a website called www.thegreyman.com, but that doesn't... It's really for the corporate side of what I do. There's okay. also siximpossiblethings.co.uk, I think, is a website... All right. ...that has details of everything. In fact, all the details of the upcoming shows, I think, is on www6, with the number six, impossiblethings.co.uk. OK, so the website to run to is six impossible things. Uh, that's with dot, the numeral six. Yeah. .co.uk. For our yes. listeners, they yes. can check that out. Well, Philip, what a pleasure it's been to chat with you. We must have you back on the show. Any time. We can do this across across the big water, can't we? We can. We can. Why not? And as a thank you, I'd like to give you um, a DVD of Australian poetry by our very own voiceover man, Jim Wilshire. I'm uh, sure you'll uh, enjoy that. Thank you very much. Lots of sort of bush poems and things like that at the outback. And, oh, well, that, I'll have to believe I came to Australia now when I go home. And my, my producer got me a lovely plate with the Sydney Opera House on it so with this and this <laughs> once I find that kangaroo I'm going to put in my luggage oh, thank you for that um, but next time you're in Sydney you'll be a most welcome guest oh, thank you so much thanks very much Richard you're listening to The Skeptic Zone I'm Brian Dunning from Skeptoid.com Joining me now, Vicky Hyde from The Skeptics, who, of course, is convinced homeopathy is a crock, and Mary Glazier from the New Zealand Council of Homeopaths. Look, good evening. Well, good evening to you, Mary. Now, Vicky, you didn't overdose from these, these, um, the various tablets that you guys took. I mean, doesn't it just tell you that it's safe? Well, that's the claim that homeopaths make, that it's safe because it's just sugar or just water. And in fact, the New Zealand Council of Homeopaths have finally admitted that there are no actual material substances in their products. Yet they'll still charge you $10 a teaspoon for it. You might as well get it out of the tap. What Very we're saying is that we think it's unethical for pharmacists to actually be selling this product without letting people know that they're just selling them water. Mary, can you tell us how homeopathic remedies actually work? I wish I could. I know that they I do can. work. I, uh, let, me do, yes. let me say something. I know that they do work, but how they work is actually, as was, has already been said, a mystery. But I know no. they work. And just because that they are harmless, it doesn't mean that there, is no, uh, that there is nothing in the remedy that is going to help people or an animal. You see, Vicky, I suppose... Mark, there's no mystery about homeopathy works. There's no mystery at all. We do know how it works. It works because the human body is really good at self-healing. The homeopaths have got that right. But they are exploiting that ability and making a really, really large amount of money off it. And that's where we object to it. If you're going to have informed consent, you should tell people we're relying on the placebo in fact, effect. When you, say, fact, uh-huh. when you say they're exploiting it, I mean, that's do you, all think, it is. you say exploiting. I mean, do you think, you, you don't believe that these are well-meaning people, Vicky Hyde? Well, you can be well-meaning as much as you like, but that doesn't mean to say that delusion or deception are a viable means of, of product development. We don't accept that from any of our product lines of one form or another. We have Fair Trading Act. We have consumer laws. If people say that a product contains something, it should contain something, not just once upon a time. Mary, Mary, something. Mary Glazing, and that's where you we talk think the ethical yes. issue is. Yes? Um, it, it's not... 
you're, you're, these people, these, these um, uh, skeptics, they are materialists. There is something happening in that remedy when it is potentized. You know that you have to start with a substance and it's potentized using water. Something happens to that water when the remedy is potentized. Mira, you know now, what it sounds like? It sounds a bit like magic. Well, I'm sorry. So we're waiting for science to catch up. We know um, that uh, Dr. Luc Montagnier has recently done a study, he's a, a Nobel Prize winner, he's a virologist, and he has, uh, as a result of his study, we think now that possibly it is something electromagnetic that, is trans that, it, that happens in the water. Mary, I'll tell you what a lot of people find knows. hard to get their head around, is this principle yes. that the more you dilute something, yes. the more effective it's going to be. I'm sorry, that's not actually true. You have to match the energy or the the potency of the remedy with a person okay now if you get a good match then you'll get a response and sometimes you'll get a good match at a high potency sometimes you'll get a good match at a low potency how do you get a do good you... match if you don't know how it works Mary because through observation you get a good match by taking the case by eliciting the symptoms from the patient and matching them using a database with the symptoms of the remedy. When you have a good match, you get a response. Okay, Vicky Hyde, if it doesn't do any harm and if people think they get a benefit out of it, what difference does it make? Well, we know 94% of people in New Zealand who use homeopathic products aren't aware that there are no active ingredients in it. They haven't been told I... that by the pharmacist. They haven't been told that by the homeopath. We think that's actually very, very deceptive and very misleading. And certainly pharmacists should not be supporting that sort of thing. I mean... We also know that people have died because they have relied on homeopathic preparations. We have coroner's case, case, cases of that dating back some years. The whatstheharm.net has over 500, I think it is at this stage, cases where homeopathy has caused harm in people because they've either relied upon it or they've had... Um, very, very bad problems associated with it when it's mixed with other herbal kinds of beliefs. Okay, let me, can I deal with, first of all, this idea that people are harming themselves by not, uh, by taking homeopathic remedies when they should be doing another form of treatment. Fortunately, in New Zealand, people are pretty sensible. And registered homeopaths also have, medic, uh, have a training in medical science. And, of course, no one would suggest that anyone should rely on any one system of medicine if it is not working. If that is foolish. Explain the coroner's Mary, case do you indeed. accept that people think you're quacks? I beg your pardon? Do you accept that some people look at you and think you're quacks? Uh, of course. And does it bother us? No. Because we know that... Uh, you can call it an active ingredient if you like, but there is something happening in that water that is there and is active and is effective. We know that. Mark. Okay, Mary, Mary, Mary Glazier there from the, the Council of Homeopaths and Vicky Hyde in Christchurch. The homeopaths also have invited Vicky Hyde to come for a treatment. We'd be interested to see what sort of reaction that gets. Hi, everyone. This is Andy Kaiser. Richard Saunders was nice enough to let me interrupt the Skeptic Zone to tell you about another gust of wind in the maelstrom of worldwide critical thought. Digital Bits Skeptic is a podcast dedicated to skepticism and critical thinking in our world of New Age, religion, and credulous pop culture. I myself write a few articles, but most are written by everyone else, and they're paid for that effort. If you're an expert in your field, if you need a forum, or if you want to make an impact on not just the skeptical community, but the world at large, I'd like to talk to you. Or if you'd just like to listen to a quality, skeptical-minded podcast, that's great too. Find Digital Bit Skeptic at www.dbskeptic.com. Join us now for Drinking Skeptically in the Think Tank. <laughs> Can I do that now? Well, no. Dr. Chrissy, we don't edit anything out of the Think Tank, but I'd like to welcome you 
Dr. Chrissy Wilson. He is joking. <laughs> Dr. Chrissy Wilson, Wilson a, a warm welcome to the Skeptic Zone team. Thank you very much. It's, it's a pleasure to, to be here. Yeah. Yeah. Please, please, please. No, no photographs. <laughs> no photographs, all right, but recording. So welcome to the Skeptic Zone team, Dr. Chrissy Wilson, and uh, welcome indeed to the Think Tank. Thank you. And our favourite club down the street, as we say. I'd also like to welcome Joe Benamu. Hello, Joe. Hello, Richard. Hello. Diane Verstappen. Hi, Diane. Hi, how are you, Richard? I'm fine, and you're looking after Angas the cow, aren't I you? I am. Ooh. <laughs> Given up on rabbits and cows. That, <laughs> and that laugh, listeners, you know it so well. It's Dr. Rachie. Hi, Dr. Rachie. Hi, Richard. Hi. In fact, I got Angas the cow for you, didn't I? Yes, you I did. did. You did. I, I spent a few days, glorious days, with my good old friend Jim Wilshire. Jim's the man who does the voiceover. He yeah, says, that's right. Welcome to the Skeptic Zone, the podcast for science, and, and he does yours. And now it's time for Dr. Rachie reports. Do- he that's does? him. That's Jim. He lives on a, a little. Um, uh, property down near uh, the Victorian border, beautiful rolling countryside and great time. Spent, uh, spent a few days. Now, what an interesting week it's been in scepticism, which it always is, isn't it? Yeah, lately it is, it seems, Richard. Every week's Lots an interesting Lots of stuff week. happening at the moment. Let me cover a few quick points um, that our listeners may be interested in. Now, if you're living in the ACT in Canberra, the Canberra sceptics in the pub have, are having their first sceptics in the pub, apparently. This is 4 p.m. Saturday, the 21st of February, at King O'Malley's Irish Pub, which is 131 City Walk in uh, Canberra Centre. So there you go. I think I've been to that pub. It's in Civic, I think. Although there are a few Irish pubs in the centre. You've been to a lot of pubs, Rachel. (laughs) There's an Irish pub everywhere in the world. Yes, there is. Every town, everywhere. Yeah, there is. I've been to an Irish pub in... um, Everywhere. Everywhere. Strange. Even in Dubai, I've been to an Irish pub. Strangely, there are none in Ireland, because they all went overseas. <laughs> yeah. um, they're all English pubs. They're all English pubs. <laughs> so, Canberra Skeptic says your chance, and uh, actually, we've all been invited to go. We have, we yeah. Have. We have got a so, message from Andrew, I think, to I don't know how if, if we can or not at this stage, but, gee, it would be it would be lovely to, to yeah. zoom down there and we have a We need to get a Skeptic's own bus, bus, don't we? <laughs> then we could do our own bus announcements. <laughs> We should do a national tour. A in, national a bus. Sc- in a bus. You want to drive? Yes, I'll drive. All right, it's on. I'll provide noms. And, and Joe, while you're providing noms, we must say happy birthday to oh, you. Oh, thank you. Happy birthday, Joe, for yesterday. 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 Great stuff. Um, all right, now, before we get on with, with what you've brought, everybody, let me start the more serious side of today's uh, show, today's think tank. I received in the post a few days ago... This wonderful DVD, which I have in front of me, Homeopathy for Health and Immunization, plus the Treatment of Vaccine Damage. This is by this wonderful woman, Fran Sheffield, from uh, Homeopathy Plus. Hmm. Homeopathy Plus, the website Hmm. that was asked to put a retraction. The website that got into a lot of trouble from the Therapeutic Goods Administration, which is our sort of consumer drug watchdog in this country, because they were making uh, unsubstantiated claims about homeopathy being useful as a substitute for conventional vaccination. And they were reported to the Therapeutic Goods Administration by a gentleman by the name of Dr Ken Harvey, who um, sent in a very long complaint detailing where they had actually um, broken sort of the advertising standards rules. And the TGA decided that 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 was to... um, that was the case, and so they sent out a very long letter to Homeopathy Plus saying that they had to take these things from their website, and in addition to that, they had to publish a retraction, which said, amongst other things, we shouldn't have said that homeopathy is effective in the place of vaccines, we were wrong, and that should have appeared on, I think, the 29th of January? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's it still didn't. not there. It's still We're not still there. waiting for it. Well, not only that, because um, I, I was visiting that website to make sure that they were complying, and, of course, they did not comply. And that's where I came across this DVD, which mm. I subsequently bought for $12.50 plus postage and handling. <laughs> and still, as of today, and we're recording this on the 10th, the 10th of February, 
as of today, and listeners probably no doubt when you hear this show, on their website they have a page, uh, homeopathyplus.com slash uh, homeopathyplus.com.au slash h plus slash shop plus uh, slash dvds.html but you can just follow the links from homeopathy plus this is the selling point for this particular dvd which i bought and we're yet to watch mm. but we will watch it well, and we'll make review us it. Watch it, aren't you? it i'm gonna make you review it mm-hmm. make you watch it and review it so the, this Horror is movie night yeah <laughs> That's true. So this is, these are the selling the points. <laughs> these, are, these are the selling points as seen on the website of Homeopathy Plus for this DVD, Homeopathy for Health, Health and Immunization. <clears throat> Here we go. By Fran Sheffield and lots of initials after her name, one of which is RN, Joe. I'm aware of that. <laughs> That's the next courtesy bus in five minutes' time, servicing Holston Park, Dulwich, Lewisham, and Sunny Hill. Thank you. And thank you. <laughs> About time we had another bus announcement. Uh, we... So just just on that note, yeah. Richard, you know, look, every every profession has got practitioners who, you know, dabble in woo of some sort or another, but um, I, I so often see registered nurses and registered midwives, you know, using, using their... their Qualifications in in practicing yeah. this sort of stuff. It's just it's just terrible. Okay, here we go. Here are the selling points. Did you know? Did you know? Homeopathy works well as as well as antibiotics without the side effects or risk of thrush. That's good to know. You can you can use homeopathy for yourself and your family members to treat many acute problems such as coughs, colds, indigestion sprains and strains and more wow homeopathy treats serious mental slash emotional and physical disorders that's did just you know dangerous that? mm. did all you, of this is dangerous mm. but saying that did you also know that homeopathy mm. can immunize babies children adults and travelers against epidemic diseases such as measles meningococcal disease hib typhoid whooping cough and hepatitis all right. Homeopathy even treats companion and farm animals and immunizes <laughs> and immunizes against their epidemic diseases. So, Fran Sheffield, homeopath and midwife, covers these points. See, they're impressed. Uh, they're walking out of the room we used to record in. Uh, Fran Sheffield, homeopath and midwife, covers these points and more as she explains how you can use homeopathy for safe immunization or the treatment of everyday health problems uh, and so on. Uh, this DVD places health care at your fingertips and is a must for anyone interested in safely treating their family's health problems. $12.50. So... But do you know, you know, on the front page of her website recently, she had the, something about a homeopathic slug repellent for quite a number of days. And then she made a claim somewhere on her website. And I reckon this is probably the only thing I've read on there that's actually correct, is that homeopathy is good for plants. Wow. <laughs> and it is, because it's water. <laughs> All right, now one of the... Sorry, no, sorry, Joe. What I was going to say, though, was, um, I mean... You know, that's nothing new. We've heard it all before. Mm. You know, the, the, the TGA have said that they can't be saying this sort of stuff. And I think Rachel exactly, and I have exactly discussed what they this are before. saying. Well, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And Rachel and I have discussed this before. And the thing is, where are the teeth of the bodies that are supposed to be doing something about this? They're they've been they've been given this ruling. They're not complying. What are they going to do about it? Okay, I can give you a little bit of an update to that because I've been in touch with Dr. Harvey who submitted this complaint and uh, the TGA were going to give Homeopathy Plus a couple of days of grace before they ticked this off as an absolute non-compliance and once they had done that, then they were going to take further action. Now, the TGA moves at glacial speeds, as you know. Mm -hmm. They're very slow to do anything. The other problem is that in 50% of cases of uh, companies like this that don't comply, they just never do, and the TGA doesn't do anything about it. Now, this is partly because they don't have the, the manpower, they don't have the staff. It's also partly because they are funded by the money they get from the drugs that they look after. 
So if they are striking off everyone that's funding them, then they're not going to be funded anymore. So that's a, you know, that, that is in itself a critical fault in how they're run. Absolutely. And thirdly, um, they do have the ability to prosecute. In fact, there is a rule that says they can fine them up to $33,000 for non-compliance. But as far as Dr Harvey is aware, that's never been exercised. So we've been having a little bit of a chat recently and with some other people as well, and this is probably going to be our next big um, campaign because he, he is of the opinion that the only way we're going to shift them into gear is to get a lot of publicity, either media-wise and political push. So we're going to have to do what we've done in the past. We're going to have to get through, get a whole bunch of people together and do some activism. That's the only way we're going to change it. So there's a lot of other stuff out there that is probably getting close to as bad as what something like Hanging Up Big Plus is doing, but people just don't have the time and the resources no. to be able to just, take them on. I must say what really got me was the fact that <clears throat> despite all this, right now on their website, they're selling that DVD. Yeah, all the yeah. things that I read out. Plus, and this is the worst of all, the DVD starts with Herb Herb Alpert. Herb Alpert. And, the, <laughs> yeah. and the Tijuana Brass. Oh, no. <laughs> Which, no, he's not annoyed because of the... He's annoyed because they're breaking the copyright of Herb so Alpert. <laughs> So, as I mean, I, you can bet your bottom dollar they've just used. Oh, this is nice yeah. music. But it's Herb Alpert. Oh, oh I you what Richard fun. has a soft spot for Herb Alpert. <laughs> a taste of honey. Of... A taste of honey. I know it's your favourite. <laughs> has it ruined it for you it now? Is. I'll oh, never no. look at homeopathy the same again. <laughs> speaking, speaking of which, some some of uh, you may have seen me Twitter this the other day, but this is now my ringtone. Here we go. Whoop. You've got a degree in baloney. <laughs> <laughs> and and Rachel. I want one too. And Rachel, when when we were driving home from the Mystery Investigators, which oh, I, yeah. our listeners would have heard the, uh, on the last episode, yeah. where we did a great show, and thank you, Dr. Chrissy, for being part of the show. Absolutely. You were the most you were, popular. You got I the know. biggest applause know, at the I end did. of that show. I yeah. actually got the biggest round of applause. Well, obviously. <laughs> These kids sort out. Yeah. They that. She, she bribed them with minties. <laughs> but we were driving back and we were near the Sydney Harbour Bridge, weren't we? Were we were about to cross the Sydney Harbour Bridge. And my phone rang in my pocket. I've got a degree in homeopathic medicine. <laughs> okay, here it is. Pass the phone to Rachel straight away because I, I, I simply don't answer the phone when I'm driving. And it was. It was Phil Plate, Phil the Plate. best. <laughs> <laughs> Telling us. Telling us the good news. He was a little bit frantic, actually, and he was saying, where are you guys? Why aren't you on the internet? You were on Skype and now you're not. What's going on? And I was like, whoa. (laughs) Um, Well, he was ringing to tell us that um, a special newsletter had gone out from our favourite anti-vaxxers, the Australian Vaccination Network, announcing that they were going to close down on the 28th of February. Hip, hip. Hooray! <laughs> but it was it was just one of those moments you never forget. You're driving a, near the Sydney Harbour Bridge and Phil Plate rings the phone. Well, I actually I actually said a bad word or two actually. You did <laughs> <laughs> because I was a bit shocked. Well, and then, then you said, "Is this really Phil Plate?" You said, "Well, it was." <laughs> It was so weird because it was Phil Plate's voice and I knew it was Phil Plate, but he was telling me something that was so unbelievable to me at the time that I said, is this a crank call? Is this really Phil Plate? And he, he said to his wife in the background, he said, how can I prove it's Phil Plate? And so then he said, uh, drobly, drobly, <laughs> which is the word that he invented. He, he thinks it's Australian slang, but it isn't. <laughs> And so then I knew that it was him because nobody else except for Richard uses that word. <laughs> yeah, so... That was that was, a, that was quite an experience. Yeah, but the funny thing too was your response because you couldn't hear what was happening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And all you could hear me was going, what? No, you're joking. Beep, beep. <laughs> and I'm driving thinking, what is Phil telling you? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Is Mars about the collide? Right? <laughs> what? What's going well, on? Well, it could have been that, I suppose. Yeah. yeah. But should we just briefly summarise that story? Yeah. Please. Um, so just quickly, she sent an email on the third of February saying that she was going to close down. And then, if you sort of read the body of the text, it explained that she um, was only going to do it if she couldn't get a large injection of cash. 
which of course Phil said exploded his irony meter because injection. She, yeah. she said injection, yeah. <clears throat> uh, and then two days later she sent another one, clarifying that she would be closing, but only if she couldn't get money. And then two days later she sent another one with a big masthead saying AVN closing down sale, twenty percent off all educational material and and books and DVDs. And that was sent, what, about four days ago? Yeah. So then she wrote a blog on Age of Autism saying that she wanted money. Which was actually um, almost word for word a repeat of something, about seven other things that she's published. Not, nothing original in any of it. A lot of it was just the same stuff over and over again. Yeah. Well, this is the quote from her. She said, "'Without a large injection of capital behind me, "'I simply cannot continue.'" And she's asking for, quote, a benefactor or series of benefactors to come forward to establish a fund that would guarantee the AVN's existence for the next three years. But then she also sent another email to her um, members asking them to donate $100 each in the next week or so. Or she'd pack up her bag and she'd take a bat and ball and leave. But, but even on the Age of Autism blog where she was saying, I'm closing, she was then saying, please subscribe to the mag. And she's already said in another email that she wants to sell the mag. And on top of that, she's said to um, people that are already subscribers, I'm sorry if you already are, but you'll just lose your money at the end of the month. And then she's saying to people, Yeah, that's true. while well insolvent. If you're going that, to close down, then you can't legally right. do that. Well, that's illegal. And I think there's a, a jail term of up to five years if you're prosecuted for doing that yeah, in, I think so, in this state. So she's not being very smart about it. Um, but she's also trading on her... Um, her position in that she's, you know, she's she's trying to make herself look like a victim in mm. in that, you know, this is really all, this is all this has got to do with is her financial situation, but she's you know she's trying to you know make it look like poor Merrill, poor AVN, the skeptics have all bombarded them and put them through so much pressure over the last year and in some ways trying to sort of make it look like they've been put through so much grief by all these horrid, horrid skeptics that now, you know, it's just gotten too hard and it's too difficult and so now we're going to have to pack up our bags and go. When in fact this is really just down to mm. the management of their... Well, yeah, she did an interview, I did an interview with where we were both interviewed separately for a radio station called 4 Z the other day, and you can find it online. Um, it's archived at 4 zwordpresscom um, And she, in that, she said it was to do with the global financial crisis that they've been in trouble since that happened. But according to the documents that we've obtained, that you can legally obtain, um, they have been slowly losing money over the, over the last few years, which led up to the $58,000 that uh, I've seen for 2008. So... I thought, I don't know if I'm remembering correctly, but that this isn't the first time that she's been in this position and called on members to give money yeah, in this think, way. I think you're so, right. Yeah, I believe that she has. In, in fact, in the time since I've known of them, I know she's done it once before, but that, that wasn't, she didn't get to a point of saying, I'm closing. She just said, I need some money immediately to pay for my um, assistant, and she got that. But in this case, she's asking for two to three years' worth of money. And that, so that's going to be a lot of money. But, you know, I'm not surprised. I got asked by this journo from this radio station about it, and I'm not surprised that she's in this situation where she wants out. And whether that's purely because of the money or because of the pressure, I don't know. But she's got two complaints pending at the Healthcare Complaints Commission, which are about to be handed down in any day soon, like probably in the next week. She's got a complaint um, pending at the Office of Liquor, Gaming and Racing because she, didn't, she traded without a charity licence for two years. Um, and she's been hounded in the press lately. Her reputation's been battered. So, you know, maybe it is the beginning of the end for the AVN. Who knows? And I'm surprised that, that the big guns haven't come to her rescue yet, like Gen Res- Generation Rescue or Age of Autism. Maybe they've got their own problems to deal with. And then, then yeah. Bill Gates came along and <clears throat> pledged... Ten billion, ten, ten, ten billion. billion dollars, not BB. billion, ten billion. Ten billion dollars, <laughs> yeah. that's right. And Wakefield's paper got retracted on the yeah. same day yeah. that she came out and said she's closing down. So, so uh, things aren't looking did, good. Um, did you see the tweet last night? Um, the, I, mean, I can't remember the name of, uh, of the journal, Wakefield's journal. Oh, um no, 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 no. It was, it was, uh, it was a tweet about the fact that um, uh, 
I, and I can't remember the name of the actual journal, but that um, this journal has agreed to republish oh. Wakefield's paper. And the hilariousness of it is that the the journal, Wakefield's actually one of the editors of the journal. Right. Um, but the the the. And I, I don't know if this would be is, correct, is it but neurotox- it's, it's neurotoxicology. No, 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 no. It's uh, it's something like it's medical something or other. Not medical veritas. Yeah, that's yes, it. medical veritas. Oh, that's right. That's the, right? That's the, the so, biggest I know. word. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. And he's he's one of the edit. He's one of the editors. And that's they, like made and shit. I know. Journal? Exactly. So they've agreed to republish so his paper, which has been, of course, retracted by the Lancet. Except that it would be it would be the but wouldn't and this is what someone was saying was wouldn't the article itself be the property of the Lancet. Yeah, so is. they can't go and just republish the paper without the permission of I'll let Lancet. Them, let them and then they can get in all so, sorts of trouble. Oh, yeah. Medical Veritas is an absolute yeah. joke. Yeah. It's, it's a website that's yeah. just about as effect, as good as Whale Shall too. back to impact factors? <laughs> <laughs> but it's not even listed on PubMed. No. It's just a made-up journal that's not... They, I think Horowitz is involved in that. Mm. That big, that woo doctor who also, um, by the way, sells LifeWave and Manatech. So, <laughs> and it's just, it's hysterical, medical veritas. Mm. Well, I like your, your alternative title, Made Up Shit. <laughs> <laughs> made Up Shit 2010. We, we should set up that channel. <laughs> <laughs> we should. Dunlop and Wilson. But, you know, <laughs> but, but, you have to, but you have to give it a, a, a Latin name to make it sound oh, more reputable. Right, made okay. Up Shit or something. Yes. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks for I'm sure one of our Latin scholars can come now. All right, let's move on. Let's move on. Thank you, Rachel, and thank you, Joe. But Joe, you have, as ever, brought along your highlight pen and a bunch of papers How does for she us. Do it? What have you for us? Um, well, uh, actually, this is something uh, we were talking about earlier with uh, with Rachel. Um, an article came out yesterday in the Sydney Morning Herald. Um, headline is "Herbal Remedies Can Kill," um, which not news to us, but uh, nevertheless, it's still actually, it's quite interesting. A um, uh, Professor Roger Byde from the University of Adelaide, who is a forensic pathologist, came out warning people about the false perception that herbal remedies are completely safe because of, you know, being natural. Um, so, uh, you know, the sort, he, he's actually done some research which has been published in the journal Forensic Sciences, um, some of which was done actually through analysing certain herbal products. And he looked at 251 Asian herbal products found in stores across the US, and he found arsenic in 36 of them, mercury in 35, and lead in 24. Um, so, you know, and a lot of them, a lot of things he's looked at are, are, are things which, you know, the general public, public see as being fairly innocuous, like uh, evening primrose oil. But, you know, drugs like this, um, he notes, are, are known to lower the seizure threshold in epileptics. And um, one of the other ones, which I think I've mentioned on the podcast before, are things like ginkgo and garlic, which when you mix them with warfarin, um, pe- people have, have bled to death from this combination. Um, so it was actually, it's really nice to see in the media that they were giving this some publicity. And um, really just, you know, that he's, he's just... He's, he feels it just needs to be a, a real warning to people to be aware of the fact that herbal med- herbal medicines are not necessarily safe. Um, interestingly, they actually quoted in the article a Dr. Wendy Morrow, who is the executive director of the Complementary Healthcare Council of Australia, who I think... Um, was rather disappointed in the article and said that it was inflammatory and designed to cause panic. Um, now, Dr. Morrow... No, Dr. Morrow is also... Uh, she, Dr. Morrow says that there is not a wide-held belief that complementary medicines are 100% safe. I would dispute that. <laughs> and um, she actually has an interesting history as the... Uh, I think one of the uh, the sort of principal people in the South Australian College of Natural Medicine, and her qualifications are that as well as being a registered pharmacist and naturopath, her doctorate is in educational administration. So she has not actually, you know, her, her doctor title is very misleading in this case. She's not actually a doctor of anything scientific. Um, and I think that, you know, presenting that as the opposing view to this article is 
misleading again. It's interesting, but, isn't it? Because this was also this one you're referring to is written by a journalist by the name of Danny Rose. Which is different to the one that you. Yeah, the one I came across was written by Nick Miller, who mm-hmm. writes for Fairfax as well, and um. I, have, I came across this article because I found it on the anti-vax list. Mm-hmm. And they were a little bit cranky about it, Joe. Mm. Um, and I so <laughs> I sent a little bit of a tweet to Nick Miller and, and notified him to the fact that they were um, not impressed with his article. And he wrote back to me and said that um, he'd received some fairly inflammatory emails mm. today from people saying, but it's natural, therefore it has to be safe. And his impression was that you know, that they can't have it both ways. No. Um, and the glaring difference between the, the two articles is, of course, that in, in Nick's article, it was pretty explicitly looking at the science of it, whereas this is this article is actually sort of given that false balance of, yeah. you know... Yeah, his was really much more mm. like a press release style yeah. where it was this article's come out and the journalist and this says this, says. this, and this, yeah. and this stuff has got toxic levels mm. of mercury and mm. arsenic. That was it. Mm. They didn't, he didn't see a comment from Miss mm. Warm and Fuzzy Unicorn. Well, I thought you'd be interested <laughs> to know. I thought, I thought you'd actually be interested to know some of the. Uh, some of the uh, the courses that are offered in her institution, yeah. which uh, include uh, a diploma of bioenergetic therapies. Oh, what? <laughs> 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 oh, what? Uh, hang on a sec. What would that be called? Oh, made up shit. <laughs> <laughs> made up shit dot com. Yeah. And, and what would what would the um the uh, diploma of herbal alchemy be called? Oh, that'd be more made. <laughs> And that's the advanced mate. <laughs> how about You're the... going to get to level two to do that. Oh, what about what about the certificate four in iridology? Oh, that's a certificate. Oh, then uh, that's when you can practice made up yeah. shit. <laughs> Doctor of made up shit. And, and what about what M-U-S. about the diploma of sound and colour therapy? Oh, <laughs> hey, I've got one of those. <laughs> I'm just pulling your leg shit. <laughs> Mush. Oh, made, up. made up shit. Yeah, M-U-S. Are we going to have to tag the podcast explicit if we say that? Oh, that, that, if you keep saying it, you'll... <laughs> <laughs> so, no, that would work great, because it would look like an MSC. You know, capital M, yeah. little U, little oh, S. Yeah. It would look like an MSC, then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Of course, since this whole business with the Shorty Awards, my blog has got a lot of hits, and so I'm getting a lot of people on there now that are not necessarily fo- followers of myself, So, which is great because there's a lot of discussion is starting. But um, there was some comments made about the dowsing story, the Iraq bomb dowsing story, and a lot of the sceptics that, that commented on that were saying, well, that is disgusting, and we know that dowsing is bullshit, and someone else got on and said you guys are just dismissing it you haven't even done your research and well the point is that you know why was Australian skeptics set up Richard originally it was set up after a water divining challenge correct 30 so years ago how much research have you done into divining personally yeah I don't know 10 years worth right okay. you know what it doesn't work. <laughs> yeah. So because of that, we can look critically at yeah. that. Those. I mean, you, if you got, if you haven't seen that video, please go and watch it because it's just so astounding that people could fall for it. But you can see people walking along beside cars, stamping up and down, up and down on the spot to generate static electricity and looking for bombs. It's nonsense. But I think that. Um, in fact, I wasn't going to actually raise this. Uh, but I, I had printed this out because I just wanted to torment myself. And, <laughs> what, you didn't get enough? <laughs> you know, I'm a masochist. What can I say? Um, but, uh, you know, I think with so many of the people who, although not all of them, and I think we said this before, there's a real lack of understanding of research and a lack of skills in reading research and understanding statistics and Interestingly, the the woman who I mentioned earlier who runs that, the College of Natural Medicine in South Australia, I got hold of the um, some of the, um, the information about the various courses that they run there. And I'm, I'm interested in what they do in these organisations because, you know, I, I sometimes look at these people and I think, well, what, what information have you actually had? What training have you had? And, and, and they really have nothing because under, you know, in their, in their undergraduate um, course which they're calling a research and referencing skills. 
the, the, what it says that they're teaching are skills to be successful in researching, formulating and writing reports, essays and assignments, note-taking, studying for and taking examinations at college. These skills include memory recall, note-taking, essay writing, assignment standards, footnoting and referencing and using libraries. Other related topics are personal planning, organisational skills, personal development and motivation. If this is what these people are being taught as learning about research... We were saying before, it's high school, isn't it? I mean, high school well, but even at high school level, you know, people are cap- kids are capable of being taught about research at a higher level than that. Yeah. So these people are coming out with no understanding of research. So when they come back at us all the time and they say, well, no research has been done and you don't know what you're talking about, they don't even know what research is. They don't even know, they so, don't even know what they're talking about. Exactly. Exactly. And, and, and I think that that, you know, uh, uh, so really half the you time when you're arguing with them, you just... No, I think I know. Yeah, <laughs> no, <it's> just... <laughs> they did too. <laughs> they did. They did too. Now, we have to wrap this up pretty soon, but listeners, you'll be thrilled to know, but while we've been chatting away, I've twi- picked a picture of the think tank tonight. Oh. Ooh. Ooh. So, actually, no, because that was days ago by the time this comes out. Days ago? <laughs> days ago you tweeted. <laughs> I tweeted oh, this right. <laughs> live in action. But I want to wrap up with uh, a correction of sorts. When I was swanning around California and I was in Brian Dunning's hot tub. <laughs> well. As you do. Some people have all the fun. That's right. I'm doing the think tub. Right. We were talking about the separation of church and state, and I alluded to the fact that Australia really doesn't have this. Well, Andrew Gould has sent me a message. Hey, Richard, you've mentioned a couple of times in the latest, the latest uh, in the Think Tub that Australia doesn't have separation of church and state. This is actually not true. Chapter 5, paragraph 116 of the Australian Constitution reads, The Commonwealth shall not make any law for establishing any religion, or for the imposing any for for imposing any religious observance or for the prohibiting the free exercise of any religion and no religious test shall be required as a qualification for any office or public trust under the commonwealth there you go yeah. okay uh, and he goes on to say he was surprised too to find this out he says now i've got the australian constitution as an iphone app maybe you should send oh. it to <laughs> How about that? So <laughs> Can you, you get go. it as an iPhone app? Yeah, well, that's what he says. I'm going to oh. check it out. I'm going to download the Australian Constitution as an iPhone app. Oh. And on oh, that, I am so sure. getting an iPhone this week. I want yeah. the homeopathy, medicus, veritas, whatever. You know, you know where yeah, they get yeah, all, yeah. I'd like to have Ma- that as an Materia iPhone. Medica. That's it. Yeah. yeah. Mush. Know. Mush. On that, <laughs> on that interesting uh, legal... Mm-hmm. Uh, note, constitution <laughs> note. I'd like to thank very much uh, our new member for coming along tonight, Dr. Chrissy. Thank you, Dr. Chrissy. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you very much. Lovely hat, by the oh, way. Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Hope, unfortunately, the listeners were not going to get the benefit of my hat. Oh, yeah, the, well, they will. They will. They, the picture. Yeah, they saw the yeah, picture. Like three days, days ago. ago. <laughs> Good in the it picture. Did, I'm sure. <laughs> Joe, thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. Lovely reports. And Diane, thank you so much for coming. No problem. And we're going to be all heading out to your favourite place in here in Sydney, Holland House soon. Yay. Yay. <laughs> to get some curry cheese. sauce. Herrings. Herrings. And oh, I can't Chocolate. wait for that. Smithfield, is it? Yes, yeah, Smithfield. Yeah, Holland House. Hours away. There's a, free, <laughs> there's a free plug. It's a great place to visit. I Holland thought you House. were going to say there's a free bus. <laughs> Dr. Aichi, what would the think tank be without you? It would be the think tank without Dr. Aichi, but I'm glad it's not. Okay. (laughs) Thank you, I think. And until next time, uh, if some of our listeners had their way, we'd have nothing but the think tank on this show. (laughs) Until the next think tank, thank you, everybody, and cheers. Cheers. Astronomy Cast takes a facts based journey through the cosmos as it offers listeners weekly discussions on astronomical topics ranging from planets to cosmology. Hosted by Fraser Kane of Universe Today and myself, Dr. Pamela Gay of Southern Illinois University Edwardsville. 
This show brings the questions of an avid astronomy lover directly to an astronomer. Together, Fraser and I explore what is known and being discovered about the universe around us. Join us each week as we take a facts-based journey through the cosmos at astronomycast.com. So we come to the end of another Skeptic Zone episode. Thank you so much for downloading this week's show. If you care to help the Skeptic Zone do what we do, we are all volunteers. You can uh, log on to skepticzone.tv and uh, send a donation our way or even subscribe to the show for about 99 cents an episode. Much cheaper than a Coke or a cup of coffee. Well, okay. Until next time, this is Richard Saunders signing off once again from Sydney, Australia. You've been listening to The Skeptic Zone. Visit our website at www.skepticzone.tv for comments, contacts and extra video reports. The Skeptic Zone.